So at this point, we've got a ton of red dots going on, and everyone tends to want a solid recommendation of the best red dot. And there is no correct answer other than thinking about how you're going to use it. So today I'll help you find the features that are important to you on your red dot so you can pick what works for you. Are you ready? Stand by. Welcome back to the Humble Marksman channel, the only gun channel here on YouTube dripping with that BDE. That's right, big dad energy. I fielded this question recently. If the wicked witch was killed by water, then what did she drink? Dude, I have no idea. I'm David and today we're gonna be talking about red dots on pistols. There are at this point a ton of viable options for red dots. Five years ago, there were maybe only two or three. And at this point, it seems like everybody is making red dots and there's only more coming out and they're only getting better. So before picking a red dot, you really do need to be thinking about the context in which you're gonna be using the pistol. If this is for concealed carry, is it for duty use, is it for competition, or is it from recreation? Because the feature set required for those four different uses is entirely different, and what may be the best site for one of those usages may be absolutely terrible in all the others. Concealed carry is generally going to favor smaller optics. Typically, the RMSC footprint, as the pistols a lot of people are carrying, are narrower pistols that are cut for the RMSC optic. A duty site basically needs to be bomb-proof. It's going to reward the geometry of the optic housing more than it's going to reward basically any other feature. A competition optic, the sight needs to be recoil immune. It needs to get super duper bright because it's only ever going to be used in clear or potentially overcast days. Nobody's putting on nods and going to shoot competition. It just isn't a thing in the US right now. And for recreation, it's just mounting a dot onto a little plinker and going out and having some fun. You don't need killer battery life. You don't need all the wisdom bang features. It doesn't even need to be that robust as long as it holds zero. But before we go any further, let's all agree on the best way to use a red dot sight. So with traditional iron sights, there is some debate on whether you look at the front sight, whether all the target and the front sight and the rear sight are all kind of fuzzy or kind of somewhere in between. There really is only one way to properly use a red dot. It is to target focus really, really hard and then superimpose the dot over the point you're looking at on the target. And there's a really easy way you can figure out whether you target focus or or not. With a safe and unloaded gun, put a piece of blue painter's tape over the front lens of the optic. Now look at a point somewhere that you can aim at and bring the gun up and aim at it. If the target disappears entirely, then you're actually dot focusing. If you can still see the target with your non-dominant eye, then you are target focusing and that's honestly what you want to develop. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and just get this out of the way. We are gonna rip the Band-Aid off and you can furiously type at me in the comments about how your favorite YouTuber who was an invincible ninja in a past life says otherwise, and I'm going to use logic and facts and reason of the competition world to show you why I support the position that I'm in. And gentlemen, I came from the small fine dots of Bloom Camp are better to now it's a pistol and a bigger dot is more suitable for a pistol. So picking reticle size is important and a pistol and how you answer what the reticle size needs to be is going to be answered by basically two factors. The first factor is your astigmatism. If a larger dot is going to look completely unrecognizable and overwhelm the target, then maybe the solution is a finer dot. However, if you use a larger dot, you don't rely on brightness to observe the dot in space as much. With my astigmatism, larger dots do not bloom as badly. I can look uncorrected at a six or my eight MOA dot that I keep on my race guns and they don't aggravate my astigmatism nearly as bad as the Delta Point Pros that I got into the dot game with uh, however many years ago it was. And the larger dots are generally not going to telegraph motion as badly as the finer dots. So finer dots end up looking twitchier and what that means is you try to steady the dot when you break a shot until you get to the point of understanding what an acceptable sight picture is. So the little fine dots are gonna be a lot more twitchy and vibrating when you try to hold them on like, yes, it's a real word. I didn't just make it up. You can look it up. It's totally a thing. So the bigger dots are going to be held more still, but I can already hear some of you saying there's two arguments why you shouldn't use big dots on pistols, and I will put them both to bed and bury them now and forever because it's pretty easy to do. So there are basically two popular dot sizes. There's the two to three MOA dots, and then there's the six, five to six MOA dots. The importance of the reticle size is gonna largely be dependent upon what your definition of an acceptable pistol range is going to be, because out to even 50 yards, it doesn't matter all 
all that much. At 50 yards, a two MOA dot is going to occupy one inch on the target and a six MOA dot is going to occupy about three inches on the target. Here's a fun little drill. You can take your same unloaded pistol with your red dot on it and find a very small aiming point on the other side of the room. It could be the tip of a light switch or the screw on the light switch cover. Now try to hold the dot aiming at that, focusing intently on it and observe how the dot moves. If you're shooting offhand freestyle, as you tend to do when you're shooting pistols, there is almost no way that you can exploit the advantage a finer aiming point is going to give you. The natural wobble that you'll have on the pistol is going to wobble outside of even what a six MOA dot would do. You cannot exploit the advantage a finer aiming point is going to give you. You just don't have hands that are steady enough to do it. And at 25 yards, which is still a long shot for a pistol, that same two MOA dot is going to be about a quarter of an inch on a target. And there is no way you can keep the gun steady to not leave a quarter of an inch circle. Similarly, the six MOA dot is only going to be like a one and a half inch thing, which is closer to what you could probably stabilize at 25 yards, but most people still can't even do that. How many one and a half inch groups have you shot at 25 yards? Most guns and ammo aren't that accurate. You probably haven't done it. And the correct brightness, unless you're shooting groups and you want a very transparent dot, is to take the dot brightness up to just about, it's about to bloom, and then knock it down one click so you can almost see through the dot. That is an appropriate level of brightness. And back to how we shoot a red dot, being a target focus, you want to be able to see the target through the dot. So generally speaking, the reticle is going to be important. If you have an option, I would recommend a six MOA dot or larger if you can get it. But if you have to settle on a two or three for the optic for your use, it's not the end of the world. It's still better than irons. Final data point, and this is anecdotal at the deep end of the competitive shooting set. Pretty much everybody is using six, eight, 10, and even 12 MOA dots in open division competition where speed and accuracy is still prized. With my open gun, Gun, I've been able to hold a sub three inch group at 25 yards with the N8 MOA dot. It absolutely doesn't matter for precision in the way that everybody will tell you it matters for precision. And the people who say, well, I can always bloom a small dot to be larger, but I can't make a larger dot smaller. If you bloom a fine dot, you're basically assured to have a dot focus. And as we discussed, the correct way to shoot a red dot sight is to superimpose it with a target focus. So if you don't mind giving up your target focus, Yes, I guess, but we've beaten that horse to death at this point, so we'll move on. The next characteristic you need to consider is the tint of the glass. Now on one end, you have the Trigicon series of optics, which is famously known for having like blue toothpaste smeared on their glass. That's called a notch filter, and it makes the dot stand out from the target in what's behind it. And on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the Hollow Suns and the Delta Point Pros, which do slightly discolor their targets, but not nearly as extreme as the Trigicon. What is nice about the blue tint of the Trigicon, again, back to having an astigmatism is generally speaking, you use less brightness, less brightness translates to less star bursting. So the dots tend to clean up better with a more aggressive notch filter like that. But also there's another feature of it. If you basically set up your dot with a kind of dark background, like say a brown dirt berm at the range, but then on like a full clear day, you point the optic at a backstop that is sending a lot more light back at you, the dot tends to wash out. That's less of an issue issue with the blue tint on the Trigicon, but not everybody's gonna be on board with that. This really doesn't matter all that much. You get used to whatever color the glass happens to be. And if you're target focusing properly, you don't even notice it. Playing off the notch filter into the battery life is the battery life is going to be important. If you've got a duty or concealed carry type optic, you want maximum battery life because you never wanna go for a firearm that doesn't have the dot on if you have trained to shoot it as a dot gun. Battery life is going to be benefited by an aggressive notch filter like the Trigicon has, which is why Trigicon Cons tend to have about the best battery life in the segment. Hollow Sun has answered the question through using a solar panel on top of their optic, which is great on a clear day at the range when you set it to auto adjust and let the sun power your optic, that's pretty cool. But other players like the Loophole Delta Point Pro, the SIG Romeo One Pro, they use a motion activated 
sensor to shut the dot off when it's not in use and it's in the safe overnight. And that tends to help prolong the battery life, but generally speaking, the heavy notch filters are leading to the best battery lives. Another thing that determines battery life is the type of battery the optic uses. The CR2032 batteries have significantly more amp hours in them than does the 1632 batteries that you find in the smaller site. So if the optic footprint is equal, then generally the one that has the bigger battery is going to have a longer usable life. Now if you're a competition shooter and you're only using your optic in practice and when somebody says make ready to you then you don't really care about battery life. You just need the thing to be as bright as you can get it whatever's appropriate since you're only shooting it on clear days. So battery life is also not important to the recreation guy who's turning the dot on and off as they go to and from the range. Obviously duty and concealed carry care more about that. And the next is going to be the housing design and the durability. So for the concealed carry sites, you want something that isn't going to break if you bump into a doorway, you lay down on your gun and you don't want the shroud to break or anything like that. It can happen that it's bumped off a bench at the range and takes a shot to the hood or something like that as well. So it's certainly something to be considered. Whereas the duty guys, they're gonna always want like the most robust housing they can possibly get. So for the duty guys, they're looking at basically two designs of windows, there is the RMR, and there is the new enclosed emitter optics, like the Swamp Fox Kraken, the Steiner MPS, the, there's a bunch of them, the Aimpoint Acro P2s. There's, there's several of these new optics that have basically two lenses of glass, whereas the old design of optics, which we would consider a reflex sight, just has that one plane of glass. The advantage the enclosed emitters are going to give you is that there can't be like dust or mud or whatever that's gonna get on the lens of the emitter and block the dot from projecting onto the glass. The other big advantage of enclosed emitter sight is that it's going to uh, make cleaning the rear lens of the optic way, way easier, especially for the concealed carry bros. Like how much shirt lint does the back of your lens need to have on it before you decide to clean it? Because if somebody shows you their carry gun at the range and they've got a dot on it, like almost assuredly, the first thing you're gonna notice is, wow, that's a lot of shirt lint, because that's what happens. Now, the problem with the super robust optics is that the rim around the glass is traditionally thicker. One of the best things about the competition optics is the bezel around the glass is typically thinner, so it almost like disappears when you're shooting it. Whereas the big enclosed emitter designs and the Trigicon RMR almost create like a tunnel vision type effect. They cut off some of your vision around the target that you're looking at, whereas the thinner bezeled stuff, it's just easier to pretend like it's not there. And moving on from that same form factor, it goes into kind of the height over the bore or how thick the base is. Loophole Delta Point Pros, Romeo 3 Maxes and Excels, Trigicon SRO, any of the competition competition style optics tend to have really thick bases that put the dot higher over the bore, whereas the Trigicon RMR tends to sink the dot down closer to where iron sights would naturally appear on a gun. So if you're brand new to the game, then the presentation from an RMR is going to be more natural than the sort of like elevated presentation that some of the thicker, bigger windowed optics are going to give you. Again, this is something that goes away with training. You get used to what your optics are and you learn to present them appropriately. It's not a major consideration, probably the thickness of the housing is going to inform how you access the battery and that is a far greater concern. Anything that has a battery door on the top or on the side tends to have a thicker body than something like the Trigicon, which is an open bottom and you basically unmount the whole optic, change the battery out, and then remount the optic and have to re-zero it. If you're using proper torque settings on a torque wrench like the Wheeler Fat Wrench, then generally speaking, the zero will come back almost perfect from remounting it. And if you're playing the red dot game at this point, I've got a link in the description to a, a torque wrench, just buy one. You basically have to have one to install the things appropriately. Obviously, and this probably should have led the conversation, the gun that you want to install the optic on is going to have its own footprint requirements. And at this point, I would say there's three, maybe four footprints that are valuable at this point. So the RMR footprint is possibly the most prevalent amongst all of the optics that are out there, followed as the MHS guns that the Army uses have Delta Point Pro footprint. So that is still a thing. So the Delta Point Pro is starting to see more options open up on that footprint as well. The RMS 
RMSC is also going to be a very popular optic footprint. It's named after the Shield RMSC, which is a reflex sight that Shield makes, but there's a ton of different options at that same size. And the last footprint that is still somewhat viable is the Noblex, Doctor, Vortex, whatever you want to call it. That is less popular. It is still a thing. Uh, there are some guns that are natively milled for that, like the Ruger American Pistol Competition, which doesn't make sense to me, but that's what they do. And the Rock Island STK 100 also comes milled for the Vortex Venom. There's obviously adapter plates that you can buy, but that raises the height over bore to the discussion we just had about you want typically a low height over bore for the dot, but it's really not the end of the world. And finally, we'll close with just some red dot tips. We talked about the torque wrench already. You need one if you don't have one. A can of compressed air to clean off the back lens of your optic and the emitter window. You can use a Q-tip or a lens pin to help get the stuff off from around the edges. Understand what your battery life is stated as being and get on some kind of rotation that is going to let you get in front of when the battery needs to be changed. If you're absolutely brand new to the dot game, those circle dot reticles actually make a lot of sense for folks like you. Or if you have just absolutely hideous astigmatisms, those circle dots tend to clean up the dot reticles for you. Unfortunately, there's not like one right answer to this. There are tons of good options at this point and it's kind of like Pokemon. It feels like you gotta catch them all at some point. And the optics just honestly keep getting better and better. These new enclosed emitter optics that are coming out now, the current generation of optics is absolutely insane. So what you get is likely to be good enough for as long as you care to use it but at the same time, what's coming out next generation is going to make you consider your choice all over again. So I wouldn't necessarily try to entirely future-proof what you're doing, but just make the best choice with the information you've got at the time. And that leads us to our closing comment. Uh, go ahead and leave a comment in the description. What is your favorite optic and why? Give an articulate response. People read the comments and you can help some people with a good response to the question. And as always, I appreciate you guys and I'll catch you on the next one.